topic is the gift of self, which is developing self-concept in gifted learners. And what I mean by self-concept is what most people think of as self-esteem. And those words can be used interchangeably, but I'm calling it self-concept on purpose because I want to distinguish it from just the idea of just thinking that you're great. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm, having, I'm talking about having a core understanding of who you are. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. So I want to start with this analogy of poker chips. So imagine that you were a gambler and you went to Las Vegas and you went in and there's a poker table and you had to make a bet. And you had to place a bet on your hand. So you've got these cards in your hand and you've got to shove some chips in. Well, if your hand is iffy, if you don't have that many chips in front of you, you're not going to be willing to risk that much. You would need a really, really good hand to be willing to risk your chips if you don't have that many chips. And I think that that is very similar to what goes on when kids don't have a strong sense of self-concept, that they don't have enough poker chips, if you will, of self-confidence, and so then they're not willing to take risks. And this isn't just socially, it's not just, you know, oh, they don't want to go talk to people they don't know. It's also cognitive risk within a classroom. They don't want to take classes they aren't sure they can get an A in. They don't want to do assignments they don't think they can get a hundred on. All of these things come into play when your self-concept isn't what it should be. So we need to learn how to stack these poker chips in the kids' favor, basically, so that they're willing to take risks. And the truth of it is, is that it's not that difficult to do it. There are specific skills and techniques that we can do to help gifted kids do this. So I want to reassure you, you do not need to worry that if you do this, you're going to create some self-absorbed narcissist who walks around thinking they're so fabulous. That's not going to happen. And they've conducted some research into exactly why this is. And I have links to the studies in the handout that you have. The first study that I'll reference was actually done by the American Association of University Women. And they surveyed kids to find out if they agreed or disagreed with this statement. I'm happy the way I am. And in elementary school, 67% of boys agree with that statement, which sounds like a high number. It's actually higher than the girls. But the truth is that's still not that good. I mean, think about it. That means that at the highest, by the age of 11 or 12 already, over three out of 10 boys don't agree with that statement. And that's kind of dangerous. When we get to high school, the numbers change, plummet really. For boys now, only 46% of boys, so fewer than half of boys at high school agree with the statement, I'm happy the way I am. And for girls, 29%. So when girls don't feel happy with the way they are, or boys, they start to seek that acceptance, they start to seek the feeling of belonging and a feeling of confidence in inappropriate places, through inappropriate activities, and engage with inappropriate people. And so I believe that there's a self-protective idea here that we can actually decrease some drug use, pregnancy, all of these things go down when self-concept goes up. Shakespeare, so I was a former English teacher, so you'll see a couple of Shakespeare quotes in here tonight. Um, actually, today is the anniversary of the publication of Moby Dick. So, yes, just a little English teacher <laughs> trivia for you. Uh, so, and Shakespeare said this, right? Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. And I believe that's true, but I think in our society, it's become preferenced to be self-deprecating rather than self-assured. That we actually get kind of uncomfortable when people are comfortable with themselves. When we hear a kid say, I'm good at math, or I'm smart, then we think, oh, what a stuck up little kid. Instead of saying, well, good for you, you know your strengths, right? But nobody says that Michael Jordan should walk around saying, Mm, I probably can't make those baskets, right? It's okay in sports, but it's not okay in academics. And that is part of the bias against intellectualism that exists in our society. 
Time Magazine has had multiple articles over the last 15 years on giftedness and gifted children in particular, and every cover is negative. Every cover has some stereotype that looks like some tiny adult sitting in an asylum every time they have an article on giftedness. And, and I could go on and on about the bias against intellectualism in our society, but that's not really my point, except to say that I think it's damaging, and it's, a, it's something that is going on, and our kids need to understand, and we as their parents and educators need to understand that they're having to combat this. So the Girl Scouts did a study, short-changing girls, short-changing men cut, and in this study, one of the things they looked at was where, where were girls feeling pressure in forming their personal identities? 90% of teenage girls in this study, 13 to 18, said that they felt pressured by the media to be thin and beautiful. And they realized that that was an unreasonable expectation. And my favorite story about this was a story I read in Vogue magazine. Two models, a model wrote the story. She said she and a friend were walking down the street in New York City. They saw covers of magazines in a window in a bookstore. And she turned to her friend and said, I just wish I looked like her, pointing to a, a different model on the cover. And her friend peered at the cover and said, that is you. She didn't even recognize herself after they got done changing her. So even though that you recognize that this is going on, it doesn't really help. Because even though 9 out of 10 realized that the pressure was coming from the fashion industry and the media, 89%, so just 1% fewer, felt that media and fashion industry were really important to them. Like even though they recognized it was an unattainable ideal, they still felt pressured to meet that ideal. But we can build self-concept in kids. And it's, I'm not just here as a bearer of bad news, right? And it's really not that difficult. There are some key strategies that we can do to make that happen. And so that's what I'm here to share with you tonight. Normally I would stand back here so I don't have to keep turning around to see what's on the screen, but I felt kind of barriered back there, so I decided to move up here. So forgive me as I turn around to make sure that I'm talking about what you're doing. So the first key that I believe, and I put it first on purpose, is that kids have to have an unshakable belief in who they are, that they have a role to play, that no one else can play, that they are vital. So how do we do this? So this is Hannah Senich, and she said this. She said, one needs to have something to believe in, right? Something for which one can feel wholehearted enthusiasm. That you need basically to feel that you're essential in the world. Now you may not have heard of Hannah Senich. Hannah Senich was a Jewish girl living in Palestine in the outbreak of World War II, before the United States became involved in the war. And the British government recruited young Jewish people living in that area to become paratroopers, parachutists, and parachute behind enemy lines. So Hannah, at the age of like 19, got trained by the British to jump out of a plane, and they dropped her down behind enemy lines in what is now the Czech Republic. Well, she was almost instantly captured by the Germans, thrown in prison, tortured. They even brought her mother in and tortured her in front of her. She was a poet. And she wrote incredible poetry while she was there in prison. And eventually she was executed by firing squad by the British, or, I'm sorry, by the Germans. And she refused to wear blindfold. She said, you can face me. I mean, she just had this incredible sense of self, this incredible belief in her own ability to do what she had been charged with doing and a belief in what she was doing. And, and even though she died very young, her poetry still exists, and to me she's a hero, not because she died, but because of how she lived, and that she was true to herself all the way. And our kids, when they have that belief, that wholehearted enthusiasm for something, and spoiler alert, it's not school, right? It's not, and it can't be. And just because they're smart doesn't mean school's going to be their passion. In fact, because they're smart, school will probably not be their passion, because it's not challenging them in their way. So Hannah said this, so how do you develop that? How do you help kids get that feeling? How do you help them feel like Hannah felt? The very key, most, first place to start is by serving others. Albert Schweitzer at a commencement address said this, you know, I, I know this, and I can paraphrase it or I can read it over here, I don't know what your destiny will be. I don't know where you're all going, but one thing I know, 
The only ones among you who would be truly happy are those who have sought and learned how to serve others. I think this is absolutely true. A lot of times when somebody's going through a hard time, our inclination is to give, give, give to them. You know, oh, let me come to your laundry. Let me bring in food. And the thing that really makes people feel better is to get outside of themselves, to serve somebody else. And a lot of times when our children are feeling challenged and stuff is going bad for them, our temptation is, well, if you do this, then I will give you some kind of reward, right? We'll go on a vacation or we'll go out to dinner or you get to do this or you get to have this. That isn't what builds true self-concept. What builds true self-concept is getting outside of yourself, serving others. And the more that we can facilitate that, the more that we can help our kids learn how to serve others, the happier our kids will be, and not just happier in general, but happy with themselves. One of the, I came upon this strategy when I was teaching English. And I was looking for writing prompts. And one day I had my students pick a topic for writing that was a challenge that they had faced when they were younger. I told them, think of something that was something that was hard for you a couple of years ago. And so they had to write a letter to their self, to themselves, to, for that challenge that had taken place a couple of years before. And they had to, in the letter, write about what the challenge was. You know, dear Sarah, I know that you're going through a hard time with X, Y, Z. And then they had to say, this is how you're going to overcome it. And they had to identify the people who helped them, the skills that they had that helped them. And for a lot of them, what was interesting was, it was just time. That eventually the problem just kind of went away. So as we did this, I found it was really powerful because students started saying to me, you know, when I was writing that, I realized that I'm having this struggle right now. And that same person is somebody who can help me again. Or that same skill I had then that helped me get through that can help me get through this. Or a couple of students said, I, it just made me realize that you know, this too shall pass, basically. So this is a strategy that we can revisit again and again. So let's see, what, what was something that you faced when you were five? What was something that you faced when you were 10? What's something that you're facing right now? And as we communicate with ourselves about ourselves, we discover the strength within ourselves.